Thank you, Julia, for that beautiful music. It's impossible not to dance when <laughs> listening to it. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone uh, to this short speedy session to showcase some of the Alliance's newest resources. Um, these have become a bit of a staple at the Alliance annual meeting, um, so you might well have attended one in previous years, facilitated by various different folk. Um, so all of the resources we'll be showcasing today are developed by the Alliance's working groups, task forces and initiatives, and some of them are truly hot off the press, having been released just last week. So good work to everyone who's been rushing to get everything ready in time. Um, if we move to the next slide, I'll share a little bit about these groups for those who aren't aware. So if we skip past those housekeepings, I think we were going to go back through them, but I think everybody should be aware now of the interpreting and the closed captioning options. If not, please uh, contact the producers in the chat box and they can explain how to access the translated captions or the interpretation. So for those who aren't aware, um, these are our working groups, task forces and initiatives. We have four permanent working groups that relate to the um, to the core functions of the Alliance. Um, so you can see those listed at the top there. Um, and then we also have seven technical task forces. Uh, and we currently have two initiatives, the Prevention Initiative and the Child Protection and Humanitarian Ag uh, Action and Education and Emergencies Initiative. We will also be showcasing some resources that uh, originated or were sort of initiated by the COVID-19 initiative, which has now come to an end, uh, but did some fantastic work during that very busy and important period. So um, if you are interested in joining any of these groups, you, you can. Um, the producers are going to pop a link into the chat box to our About Us page of the website. If you scroll down on that page, you can click through into individual pages for each of the groups and contact through that, that page the, the leads of the working group or task force, um, many of whom who are on the call today and you'll be hearing from shortly. Um, so, without further ado, I'd now like to hand over to our first speaker, Sabine Rakotu Malala, uh, who's one of the co-leads of our Family Strengthening Task Force. Sabine, over to you. Thank you, Camilla, and thank you, Aching, for the lovely introductions. Um, so, my name is Sabine Rakotu Malala, and I'm here as part of the World Health Organization, but actually today I'm presenting with my colleagues, Asara from Save the Children and Marianne from War Child. Um, based in Lebanon, representing the Family Strengthening Task Force, which includes many agencies, IRC, IFRC, Plan International, ACF, TDH, and others. And I'll be presenting a tool that really should relate to every single one of you, because I think every single one of you has a parent or a caregiver, and some of us are even parents. So just take a moment just to remember you as a child and the role of your parent or caregiver. The tool we're presenting is called the Compendium of Resources for Family and Caregiving Strengthening in Humanitarian Settings. It's a long title. Um, it was it's a project that was initiated a couple of years ago, um, at the start of COVID actually, and really based on the fact that many of our organizations were engaging with families and caregivers in so many different ways, and we felt that we needed to bring these different resources together to help scale up the support to parents and, and families. So you'll see in the companion, which is available online, I'll, I'll pop it into the chat just after this. Um, it's a collection of programs and publications that are linked to different outcomes like early childhood development, improved learning capacities, parental mental health, child mental health, and child protection. Um, and interestingly, regardless of their intended outcome, <clears throat> most of the initiatives and programs actually focus on improving the interaction between parents and children. For instance, by promoting communication and play, reinforcing positive child behaviors, avoiding harsh discipline, and supporting child self-regulation. So really, regardless of what the outcome is, a lot of the core components are very much the same as what we're seeing through this compendium. Um, also, interestingly, I think important for people to know is that the evidence base for parent support interventions has rapidly expanded over the past 20 years. In fact, over the past 10 years, more than ever. So as of uh, 2021, there were over 430 randomized control trials from 65 low, middle, and high-income countries, and 18 of these showed intervention effectiveness in humanitarian settings. So there's more and more evidence across the, across the globe 
but also for humanitarian settings. And these effects, the positive effects are seen in poor and wealthy countries, and they're equally strong for younger and older children. And also uh, the effects are positive for high risk families, such as single parent households, which is often the case in humanitarian settings. So what we've done is set up a tool so that you can sort the um, different in, um, publications by name, by agency, by intended outcome, by type of tool. So is it an intervention or is it a program or is it a guideline? The language available and whether it's been evaluated or not. Next slide, please, Camilla. Um, so you'll see from the next slide that um, there it, we managed to, to collect 58 resources. 30, three of these are training materials. Six of them are more global approaches. Five of them are guides. And 36 of these are interventions. And they're very much English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, so we really, I hope you'll be able to, to, to look into this. You'll see it's a PDF document, but there's also an Excel document so that you can sort. And, and we're working with Kira from the Alliance who will be setting it up on a web platform to make sorting and finding as easy as possible. We do, we realize this is not going to be a, this is going to be a living document. We hope to update it actually on a yearly basis. We even hope to disaggregate it by countries where implement, implementation has occurred and maybe even disaggregate it by intended age groups for the intervention. Voila, that's it from my side. I really hope you look at the tool, you, that you enjoy it. And most importantly, if you have any questions or if you want to join the Family Strengthening Task Force, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Back to you, Camilla. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sabine. It's very exciting to see this resource come into its conclusion, or at least it's ready to launch phase. I will now hand over to Elena Giannini from our Learning and Development Working Group to take us through their latest resources. Over to you, Elena. Thanks, Camilla, and um, good to hear about these this resources from the Family Strengthening Task Force. That's amazing. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Elena uh, Giannini from one of the colleagues like, of the Learning and Development Working Group. Um, together with Katie Robertson, we'll join you for the What's Next session uh, tomorrow. Um, we have prepared a short video, so if the lovely production team can actually play the video, that would be great. Thank you, Julie and Co. Good afternoon. We join you today with breaking news from the Learning and Development Working Group at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. Complementing the introductory learning package on the CPHA Primary Prevention Framework, the new Primary Prevention Focal Point Training has been developed and piloted at the global level. The course materials, including the session plans, slide deck and accompanying resources are now available via the Alliance website. In addition, two short animated videos have been produced to support the rollout of the primary prevention framework. The videos cover the definition of primary prevention and the importance of investing in primary prevention and child protection in humanitarian action. The videos are available in English, Arabic, French, and Spanish on the Alliance YouTube channel. And finally, with support of various sector experts, a short narrative document on the evolution of the CPHA sector has been prepared and published on the Alliance website. A summary video is also available via the Alliance YouTube channel. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this short video. We try to keep you in, to keep you um engaged. Um, you can always write to the LND working group. I will drop our email addresses in the chat in a second. And I think I'm handing over to Susanna Davis from the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group. Over to you, Susanna. Thanks so much, Elena. And good afternoon, good evening, good morning to a few colleagues. Uh, really pleased to be here uh, representing the CPMS working group. Uh, as some of you might be aware, the CPMS Working Group has since uh, late 2021 had an ongoing project to strengthen work across sectors for children's protection and well-being, and looking particularly at how we can advance the implementation of CPMS Pillar 4 and its eight standards on child protection, mainstreaming and integration at the global, regional and country level. In the last year, we've been so pleased to strengthen our partnerships with sectors like education, health, camp coordination and camp management, and food security, 
And together with leaders from each of these sectors, we have a number of new learning and practical tools to support multi-sectoral practitioners in strengthening work across sectors for children's protection. So I'm gonna take you on a whistle-stop tour of a few of them. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, uh, the first set of tools we have for you is an expansion of the CPMS e-course. So our self-directed online course has four new modules looking at cross-sectoral collaboration amongst health, food security, education, and CCCM actors for children's protection. So for each of these modules, it was very much de developed in collaboration with the other sector. So for example, with health actors, and it's very much a joint resource that's targeted both at child protection actors and at health actors. So if you're um, beginning collaboration with any one of these sectors, or if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about how you could collaborate with some of these sectors for children's protection, the e-course modules are a great starting point. They're a great starting point for your colleagues from other sectors. You can find them now on the CPMS e-course page on the Alliance website. They're all currently available in English and French, Spanish, and Arabic will be coming this summer. The second re uh, set of resources that we have, if we can pop along to the next slide, please, are two new learning videos. Um, so both of these are available in four languages, and they're nine minute videos that are exploring on one hand food security and child protection collaboration, and the other on education and child protection collaboration. Similar to the e-course, these are very much joint products that we developed together with the, the colleagues from the other sector, um, and they're great discussion starters. So if you're um, looking at how to advance child protection mainstreaming and, and integration with either of these sectors, and maybe you're having a meeting, maybe at an interagency coordination group or an internal outreach, you can share the video first and use that as a launching point for discussion. We also really encourage you to share them across social media. As I said, they're available in four languages, um, so a great resource from colleagues right across the globe. And finally, our last set of resources, if we can pop onto the last slide, we have two good practice reviews on cross-sectoral collaboration. So one on education and child protection and one on um, collaboration between uh, camp management and camp coordination and health and child protection. So these are um, tools where we've gathered the available evidence, good practice and case studies on collaboration between these sectors uh, and for children's protection and well-being. And they're really excellent tools if you are re if responsible for writing proposals for child protection, mainstreaming and integration activities, or if you're putting together talking points to try and convince senior management or humanitarian leadership to prioritize child protection, mainstreaming and integration. Um, both of these resources would give you some data, some examples that you could point to. Um, please do take a look at them, share them with your colleagues and put them to use in your work. Each of the different sets of tools that the CPMS Working Group has shared with you today are really practical examples of how to implement the centrality of children and their protection, the theme of our meeting this year. Um, so we hope that uh, they will be of use to you and we do encourage you to share them widely. Um, that's everything from me, and I think I am handing over next uh, to my colleague Rachel McKinney, who will also be sharing some resources around child protection and education collaboration. Thank you, Susanna. So building on uh, Susanna's presentation on the collaboration between education and child protection, um, and noting that this this guidance note builds off of the joint initiative between child protection and education and specifically the collaboration between the Alliance and the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. In the past um, several years, several documents, in addition to those already mentioned in, in this current hot off the press, have been developed with the guidance note um, that, that you're seeing here, the Supporting Integrated Child Protection and Education Programming and Humanitarian Action, being the latest of the more in-depth um, guidance provided to practitioners, um, going a little beyond uh, examples and more towards um, 
really thinking about where where child protection and education intersect. So uh, the the main points of intersection, not only in terms of programming, but also in terms of touch points with the child across the, the socio-ecological model from the child family um, all the way to policy. In this guidance note, we actually included a separate and additional um, layer, which is the learning environment, also known as schools, and thinking through how we um, intend to support and um, the impacts that we want to see as, as a collaboration through collaborations between the two sectors, um, thinking through everything from um, safe access to learning environments, to um, protection within the teaching and learning um, relationships between caregivers, including teachers, staff, um, but also parents and the way that parents and communities engage in, in the education process, really thinking about how we um, support um, education. And, and I have to say, I, I am sitting here from, from the seat of an educator. Um, and and um, so my, my perspective is more on the education part, the, the more traditional learning space, education space. Um, and through this collaboration, through the development of the guidance note, we as educators are made more mindful of how we can very intentionally um, collaborate and build in protection across the entire um, programming um, cycle from preparedness all the way through recovery, but also through every aspect of the education program from the systems level, policy level, all the way to the, the curriculum and the content that's made available um, in the classrooms, the guidance provided to teachers, for example, on how to both um, explicitly and proactively protect children, but also the messages that they, they need to be sharing with children and the skills that they need to be building with children so that children can also learn to protect themselves, um, not only in conflict and, and crisis, but also beyond, um, you know, um, in every every aspect of of life, regardless of whether it's in crisis or not. So I I would encourage all of you, um, even if you are are you know only coming from one sector, I would really encourage um, everyone to look at this um, guidance and to to see how all of us can contribute to safer schools, safer learning experiences, and safer learning environments. Um, and I think I am handing over now to Camila. Thanks so much, Rachel. And of course, also to Susanna, Eleanor and Sabine. Um, it's just great to see how much activity there has been on the education and uh, child protection collaboration front since this initiative was launched back in 2018. Um, and now with the added you know, um, energy behind working across sectors from the Alliance's current strategy, which obviously the CPMS working group has been uh, really strong uh, advocates for. We, we're also showcasing another um, resource on education and child protection linkages that's coming out soon tomorrow in our What Next session. So there's there's a lot of resources for those of you who work already with both sectors and other sectors as we know a lot of local and national organizations do you know uh, it's very rare to see a purely child protection focused organization that's a, a local national organization potentially because of the difficulty in funding child protection work and, and the need to do diverse um programming to sustain organizations um, but also, you know, because that's that's how things work at community level often. Um, so we wanted to take a brief pause. We've um, we've heard from four of the, the groups. Um, what are you finding most exciting or useful so far? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat box. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly not to put the four uh, who've just presented in, in competition as to who's more exciting or who's more useful, but more to see, to see what's resonating with you. So maybe you can say a little bit about where you're from, what programming you do and what you're finding um, useful or exciting about, about these publications. Please also feel free to ask any questions you have while you have uh, the, the people leading on these um tools and resources uh, with you in the room. And I did also want to say um, hello to the two participation hubs who I see are 
with us and joining. Um, it's really nice to see you there. And uh, we hope that um, it's uh, interesting to be together going through some of these um, sessions, uh, particularly the more interactive ones. Okay, so um, let's see um, what to, to look at next. So we are going to move to um, Elenia. De Marino, I hope I've pronounced your name right, Elenia, we're on first name terms, who is the co-lead of the Alliance's Child Labour Task Force. And if any of you saw uh, Elenia and Simon in action yesterday for their World Day Against Child Labour session, it was truly fantastic. So welcome back, Elenia. Thank you, Camilla, and perfect pronunciation on my very difficult last name. Uh, so thank you very much and hi everybody. I'm very, very happy to finally present uh, the Global Child Labour and Education um, in Humanitarian Setting background paper that was uh, recently developed by the uh, Global Child Labour Task Force. Uh, as Camilla mentioned yesterday, for example, Ruba, uh, that was the child advocate that participated in the child labour session, ask us for quality and inclusive education for all children to prevent child labor. And I really believe that this uh, paper fits perfectly with Ruba's statement because it uh, proposes some key action for practitioners, policy and decision makers to prevent and respond to child labor in humanitarian action. Uh, next slide, please. So what the paper shows is there is, is that there is a clear two-way relationship between education and child labor. And I will explain very briefly in two points why. So the first point is that education is a fundamental rights for all children and is also a key element to prevent child labor. And uh, the evidence in the paper show that the insufficient provision of education keep the children outside of the classroom and push them and their family to engage into work. Uh, but the paper also shows that uh, poor quality of, the, of education might also um, lead to school dropout and to prioritize work uh, over education. So that's why access to education and education quality, they really play uh, an important role in preventing child labor. Uh, the second point, and as you may know, especially after the session yesterday, is that child labor is the, uh, one of the main obstacles for education. And in most cases, it prevents um, children to you know, attend school, but also to remain in the school system. And it also impacts their performance if uh, they get to attend school. So uh, an example in the paper is that uh, you know, some types of child labor, they might uh, affect children's uh, social status, appearance, behavior, and they can lead to discrimination or bullying which is not only from children, but also from uh, the teachers. Um, and another element that is very important to highlight is that um, the fact that uh, these children can uh, do not have the ability to get all the full uh, benefits from education, uh, it will uh, provoke some negative consequences for the future. Uh, when we talk about opportunities for uh, uh, decent work, human development, but also the ability to participate in the political and social life for their communities and to uh, realize their aspirations. Uh, next slide, please. So we know all that child labor is a very complex issue, but this paper is also gives some sorts of solutions. And these solutions are a set of recommendations that are based and structured around the interagency uh, network for education in emergencies minimum standards. And they are adapted from the interagency toolkit uh, preventing and responding to child labor in humanitarian action. See, as we've seen uh, in the previous presentation, uh, this is a very good example of collaboration between two global uh, networks. Uh, some of these uh, key actions that you can find in the paper, they may refer to community participation, protection and well-being, but also on something like uh, facilities and services. Uh, I can give you two quick examples. Uh, one of the recommendations is to integrate child labor in education assessment or to use, for example, a specific curriculum for working children and adolescents. I will conclude by saying that uh, in the paper, uh, the paper also reiterates that multi-sectoral interventions are needed in order to prevent child labor. And these interventions, of course, includes education, but also child protection, health, livelihoods, and cash. 
um, the very good news is that this paper is available on the uh, Alliance website and it's free, of course, to be downloaded and shared across the, the, the networks. Uh, I believe the links have been shared in the chat. Um, unfortunately, the paper is only available in English, but feel free to reach out if you think that we, it would be useful to have this paper in another language. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I pass it over to Josiah Kaplan, that is the co-lead of the Alliance Assessment, Measurement and Evidence Working Group. Hi, colleagues, and thank you for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm co-lead of uh, the Assessment, Measurement and Evidence Working Group um, on behalf of UNICEF Office of Research, along with my colleague Armin Artsoyan from World Vision. Uh, Camilla, thank you so much for emphasizing that this is not competitive because we do not have uh, animation to share. So, <laughs> we'll I'm, forgive I'm you, Josiah. Do you remember thank you in so your much. excitement to talk nice and slowly, though, for the interpreters? Of course, yes. Um, I, we're going to share with you um, uh, a product that, that we just released, um, uh, focusing on a, a very point specific, but we feel um, uh, you know, very timely and well needed um, input, which is uh, guidance on qualitative assessment approaches uh, for protection of children with disabilities in humanitarian contexts. Um, as I don't need to tell colleagues on this call, um, children with disabilities have a distinct range of vulnerabilities in humanitarian settings. They're often unable to access services and protection um, that they need. Uh, one major underlying barrier to this is um, that a lot of the data we have on populations and how that data is methodologically collected and mapped often excludes or underrepresents the voice of children with disabilities as well as their caretakers. Um, this is in part because we uh, rarely have uh, truly mixed methods approaches. And so with quantitative surveying, um, which is essential for uh, baselining and for data collection, um, it's also imperative that we, we complement that with qualitative methods to produce uh, more robust assessments. Um, qualitative research surfaces subjective perceptions, needs, priorities of children with disabilities uh, and their caretakers. It provides a holistic, uh, what researchers call thick narrative understanding of how um, uh, these children define risks and barriers and protective factors in their own voices um, by capturing the direct voices of children themselves and by extension uh, allows us to inform more effective intervention design. Uh, and tailor it to the lived realities they face. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this guidance note, uh, which was prepared um, and led by uh, Stephen Dahlia, so sincere thanks to Stephen for, for his fantastic work uh, in this, is, is uh, an accessible summary of promising practices for engaging with children with disabilities through qualitative approaches. Um, this is an overview uh, in an accessible, um, language for uh, uh, practitioners, but it also includes sample tools and instruments it can be tailored to fit the needs of particular assessment. So very much with the intent here in design of being an off the shelf resource, a menu of options. Um, and uh, our, our methodological guidance and the tools associated with each of those approaches um, really emphasizes capturing the data with relevance for cross sectoral responses, particularly um, so we, we, we focus on WASH, education, health, nutrition. Um, it's intended for a broad audience of child protection actors, uh, both practitioners, coordination groups, researchers, and donors. So while it is technical, it is written in a way that we hope will allow you as the audience to selectively go as deep as you'd like into this, um, or perhaps use it as a resource to, to share with teams and colleagues who would be working at, at a, a more technical level of uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Uh, next slide, please. I'm very happy to give uh, uh, the floor back uh, an extra minute of, of move room in, in this uh, session, just to say that the guidance zone is available. Um, really happy to follow up with any questions offline. Uh, and thanks so much for the opportunity to share. And I believe over to Ilsa. Yes. Okay, I'm very happy to also add on this uh, hot of the press session with the case management training package. So case management is a critical activity within child protection programming or response in any setting, including humanitarian settings, to ensure like that children's uh, and their 
resourcing protection concerns that their needs are addressed. And so the case management task force uh, recognized the opportunity to update the existing case management training package uh, to further strengthen the capacity of caseworkers all around the world. And so on behalf of the case management task force and with the support of the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, IRC led on a project to update the Alliance Child Protection Case Management Training Package. So I would like to, to explain in these few minutes uh, how this training package looks like. Uh, we did not only update it, um, but we also added a lot of new content. So instead of one training package, we now have six different child protection case management trainings structured in three different levels, as you can see on the slide. With this structure, we aim to promote gradual learning and also incorporate like opportunities for supervision and coaching in um, in a caseworker's learning and development. Uh, because as each child is different, a caseworker really needs to have the skills and the ability to identify and um, respond to the individual needs uh, of the children. And it's really hard to learn this from just one training. So the training package is filled with exercises in which caseworkers will have to apply the knowledge, demonstrate their skills, practice child protection risk analysis. And we really tried our best to make it as facilitator friendly and as practical as possible. So the content of this training package uh, is pretty huge, but it starts with a competency framework. So the uh, child protection case management training uh, package was shaped within this framework, which lists the essential competencies, so knowledge, skills, and attitudes for caseworkers in humanitarian settings. And there's also a tool connected to this, which is a child protection uh, case management competency self-assessment, so that caseworkers can assess their competencies and use it throughout their learning process. And then at the basis, you can see it on the slide, it's really this, the first step. We have the foundational training, which focuses on, on basic knowledge, attitudes, and skills for any caseworkers. And so besides the learning of the case management steps, uh, it also focuses on um, skills and knowledge that we consider basic, so such as, for example, uh, just in communication to a child's ability, age, developmental stage, and also taking cultural considerations into account, or the caseworker's role in providing psychosocial support uh, to children, to parents or caregivers, and also how to provide immediate support. So this uh, foundational training um, includes all of the basics, but it's not limited to the six case management steps. And to adhere to case management principles, but actually also humanitarian principles, for example, to do no harm, we re recommend that any case worker should complete this 11 day, because it's 11 days of uh, training, foundational training before starting to provide case management. It's, it's cut into bits and pieces. Um, and if you want to more, know more about it, I'll, I'll uh, share later where you can find the packages. And then we have level two competency based training. This competency based training actually like goes beyond the steps, but focuses on these core competencies that a caseworker should apply in any step. For example, we have internal and external self-awareness, how unconscious bias influences your perspective, problem solving, negotiation strategies, and so on. So it doesn't focus on the steps, but rather on competencies used in any of the steps. It's a five-day training, and it uses the existing experience to further strengthen a caseworker's capacity. For example, there's case discussion, reflection exercises on past experiences. So a caseworker can participate to the competency-based training level two after completing the level one foundational training, but also after having gained at least a few, monument, few months of experience because these experiences will be used throughout the learning. And then level three, we have advanced but optional trainings. We have a five-day uh, child protection information management system, CPMS plus training, a four-day training on family strengthening, a five-day training on mental health and psychosocial support in case management, including a handbook filled with uh, focused on specialized MHPSS activities that a caseworker can use, and a three and a half day training on uh, unaccompanied and separated children, which was contributed by uh, UNICEF.
Also for level three, as you can see on the slide, it's really steps up. It's important that the caseworker has completed the level one training and also preferably the level two prior to joining the level uh, three trainings. And then quickly in the next slide, I want to show you before I go um, where you can find these materials. So we, we launched the Child Protection Case Management Training Package on the 30th of uh, March through a webinar. Um, and if you would like to know more, you can also uh, access the recording of that webinar on the Alliance YouTube channel. And this launch actually reconfirmed again that case management is such a critical activity within child protection. As we had so many people attending this webinar, I think we the Alliance at the time. But also if we see the number of downloads, because for example, now you can find uh, all the child protection case management training uh, on the Alliance, as you can see on the, on the training and e-learning webpage, and they are available in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. So if you click on the language buttons, you will have the, uh, the right language, and then you can download them as well. So in the first month, the level one foundational training was downloaded more than 4,000 times. I have no idea. I wish you should check with uh, my colleagues of the Alliance how many times it's been downloaded now. But I do hope that this help of the press session will contribute to um, further disseminating this case management training package. And for this, I would like to thank uh, the Alliance for uh, providing also the opportunity for me to present uh, the case management training package. And then I will now give the floor to Nidhi, who is uh, representing the Alliance COVID-19 initiative. That's it. Thank you so much, Elsa. And thanks, Camilla, for the opportunity to speak today. So I'm here to share a new mini guide series that has been in the making for the past two years. Um, these mini guides were developed to incorporate new learning from COVID-19, um, but also from recent Ebola and, and cholera outbreaks um, in response to wide stakeholder consultation at global, regional and national levels. Um, we spoke with practitioners from child protection, health and MHPSS backgrounds over a period of several years to develop these guides. Um, the guides themselves were co-authored by Hannah Thompson and myself. Um, and work was spearheaded by the Alliance, as well as by the Ready Initiative, um, which is a consortium led by Save the Children. Uh, the work was funded by BHA and the Oak Foundation and overseen by a steering committee involving additional key actors, including the CPAOR, uh, the Global Health Cluster and the MHPSS Reference Group and MHPSS Collaborative. Um, so we've had some really heavy hitters there to help uh, ensure the technical content was on par. Um, we've tried to cover um, topics, uh, diverse areas of work within major disease outbreaks. So there's six guides at the moment. There's the adaptation of child protection programming in infectious disease outbreaks, advocating for children's um, protection, uh, the centrality of children and their protection, uh, collaborating with the health sector, communicating with children in outbreaks, preventing harm to children in outbreaks, and prioritizing child participation in outbreaks. And much of the material can be used towards outbreak, outbreak preparedness in addition to response and recovery. So even though uh, hopefully COVID-19 is behind us now, we, we know that much of the material can be used towards preparing for that next major outbreak um, in diverse settings. Uh, the mini guides are brief, practical and field oriented. Uh, so most of them are around 15 pages long maximum. Um, they've, been, they've been developed in response to feedback from our consultation process where many of the end users were overwhelmed with the amount of guidance that was produced during the pandemic. So these are really designed to be practitioner oriented. Um, and the links I think are being shared in the chat now. The last two guides, Preventing Harm to Children and Prioritizing Child Participation, will be posted shortly online. And all six guides will soon be available in multiple languages. In addition to English, there will be Arabic, Spanish, and French. And if there's a need for additional languages, please do be in touch. Uh, the guides were written with non-native English speakers in mind. So even the English versions are as, as written as accessibly as possible. Um, and links to the landing pages for each of the guides are being shared. Um, and so you know where to find them when they're available. So yeah, I'll pass back to uh, Camilla now. Thank you so much. 
Thanks so much, Nidhi, Ilsa, Josiah, and who else did I have um, presenting? I feel like I've forgotten someone. Elenia, thank you all. That was really fascinating. And I knew quite a lot about those resources already, but I, I now I feel I know even more and I'm even more inspired to go and read them and use them again. Um, so uh, you'll have seen the chat box filling up and up and up and up throughout the session. <laughs> You've probably been rushing to click and download um, lots of the links shared, um, but you can also explore the resources link um, resources page of our website, which Kira has posted almost at the top of the chat box, um, because uh, that uh, is a really useful way to navigate more resources than just these ones published in the last year. But also it gives you lots of different ways of searching for resources you might like. And then, of course, uh, resources in all the different languages as well can be done downloaded there um, and as I think one of the speakers said if you if you really feel you'd like a resource in another language uh, French Spanish or Arabic our core languages that hasn't been translated please do let us know we, we might not have funds for it but you know you never know what opportunities might arise it's good for, for that to be flagged with us um, we're going to finish this session a little bit early um, so I just wanted to quickly showcase what's next so if you stay on this link you will be able to join the advocacy working group session on advocating for the protection of children, getting the message right. So you will be asked to support them, I believe, in developing some of those messages. Um, if you if you if you wish, otherwise just to, to join. Um, and then if you want to join uh, the other sessions from the unaccompanied and ch separated children task force or the family strengthening task force, you need to leave this zoom link, go back to your zoom events lobby, look at the list of sessions that are there and find 7.2 or 7.3 and then click into that link. So I hope that makes sense for anyone who's new to the platform. Um, and I and I do hope that we get a good spread of people across those those three sessions because there's been a lot of work uh, put into getting them all ready. Um, so we'll take a short break now. There will also be a poll coming up in the chat box for you to give a little bit of feedback on the session so we know is this the kind of session people like? Should we do it again next year or should we do something different? And um, without um, jumping off, without saying thanks to everybody, many, many, many thanks to all of our very, very busy speakers who've not only worked extremely hard to put these resources together but have also make, made time to join this session today and share about them um, we hope you find the resources useful thanks very much everyone mm -hmm.